Greetings. I'm John Duvall. Good morning, or afternoon here. I'm Paul Adams. Good morning. I'm Thomas Thornhill. Good morning. I'm Daniel Duvall. We're so glad that you're able to join us for our time period of studying the Word of God. Gentlemen, how are you all doing this morning? Doing great. Uh, glad to be able to come together to study God's Word, and not just to study it, but to be able to apply it into our daily lives as we factor the truth. Absolutely. Tom, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. It, it's good to be back. Uh, we, we've been suffering with our miserably cold weather here. It's actually gotten to the mid-30s. Uh, almost almost record breaking and and but but it's supposed to be close to 80 degrees by Friday so we should be okay I think our forecast has single digits within the next week Daniel how about yourself how are you getting along up there in uh, Illinois or uh, <clears throat> doing great I, I, I live in Indiana but visited my <laughs> folks here in Missouri uh, this week so having having fun uh, pray for my safe travels back on Saturday and I look forward to our discussion and, and audience uh, we and those who have joined us we appreciate any comments or questions that you guys bring uh, you guys really make the program uh, eat is so much more better if that's even a so much more better I don't know. Oh, better <laughs> <laughs> well yes <laughs> we'll accept yeah, yeah. that yeah, exactly. right. and, and on that note I I just wanted to mention real quickly it is good for me to be back um, I uh, I know Daniel started last week uh, basically so that you had three of you while I was gone. I I delivered my son, if you will, to where Daniel is, uh, where he's starting his two year uh, two year preacher training program there in St. Robert, Missouri. Uh, I I actually flew home on Friday. Um, I I drove with him there so he wouldn't have to drive alone, and then we flew home, or then I flew home, and of course he's there adjusting it's a little bit colder than what he's used to but he will do fine so. well very good very good hey, hey John I wanted to mention uh, briefly yes. that besides the three of us or four of us I should say in, in the uh, chat room today I see that Josh Thornhill Tom's son is there along with uh, your wife Rhonda there's a young lady by the name of Tammy Salmon oh yeah and, Tammy mm -hmm. okay Randall Duvall's there, David Cox, and Ken Chapman uh, have joined us today along with four viewers. And our viewers, if you would like to take a moment to sign in as a guest into the chat room, that will enable you to be able to join in the discussion by posting your comments and questions there. Or you can always email them, and John will be monitoring that email uh, at questions at truthfactor.com. That's right. That's right. Um, Tammy lives in... Um, Al, uh, New Mexico. <laughs> Had to stop and think for a moment. <laughs> well, I tell you what, we left off last week in our study of James chapter 2, right about verse 14. And verse 14 kind of brings us into not so much, I, I don't want to really say a different topic, but James does step more now into addressing the idea of, of faith. Um, if we go back to chapter 1 and think about it, he tells us to be doers of the law and not hearers only, uh, looking into that perfect law of liberty. And then when we go back to the start of chapter 2 there, we see him discussing several things all the way from showing partiality to um, standing for the whole of the law and, and recognizing that even for guilty in one point, we become guilty of the law of Christ there. And, and the one thing to remind ourselves of, while his writings here sounds like he's referencing Old Testament law, it is the law of Christ and the things that Christ taught in establishing the foundation for the church, establishing that new covenant. But kind of connecting that now with, you know, being doers of the law and, and overcoming temptations that's seen there in chapter 1, Paul, we'll start with you here. What, what, is, what would, would you say would be now the main subject that James is switching to in verse 14? Well, as I look at that, he asks some questions that are very probing that involve our faith that we profess and its connection with the life that we live and how, how those things uh, balance together. And there's a great question here. Uh, he says, if a man has faith but does not have works, the question that he poses at the beginning of this is, can faith save him? And that's a question that we'll have to answer today. That's right. 
Now, we've talked about this before, Tom, in, in that, in that uh, scholars speculate that James wrote this sometime between 45 and, and 50 A.D., possibly not long after the, the, the big discussion we see in Acts chapter 15. Could we make a connection kind of between maybe what some people were trying to advocate that had been converting out of Judaism? Do you think there may be something that was circulating during the time that he had deals with here? Or do you think just, just a general admonition to make sure that we, while we profess our faith, that we are doers? Oh, I, I absolutely think that there's a connection from the standpoint of, in so many books that we look at in the New Testament, we find uh, the concerns of Judaism versus uh, Gentilism, or, or however you want to describe okay. that, you know, or excuse me, the Jews versus the Gentiles, but both are Christians. That would right. be the better clarification. And, and so often the emphasis is, is on you do not need the works of the old law to be saved. Well, it's very possible that as a result of those types of discussions that you have individuals maybe thinking, hey, I don't have to do anything. And sadly, that's a very familiar discussion today because I'm sure that as we get on into this text, we will get, on, get into the uh, companion texts dealing with some of the passages that are quoted here and um, that do deal with faith, you know, for example, Romans 4. And all, all of that will be tackled in this, and of course, as, as we discuss this, we'll very clearly see that the type of faith that God expects us to have is where we actually do something, but at the same time, we also have to understand that what we do does not earn our salvation. You know, we... Amen, we, amen. amen. Yeah, we, we see a similar teaching in the religious world today regarding people saying, well, God's more concerned about your faith. And I've heard brethren say that the Old Testament was all physical and the New Testament was all spiritual and God's more focused with, well, God's more concerned with us spiritually, uh, unlike the Old Testament where it was all physical. And, of course, I take issue with that because it's within the Old Testament, Leviticus and Deuteronomy, that he teaches us, taught them to love the Lord their God with all the heart, soul, mind, and strength. And their obedience unto him had to come from the heart. But right. it, it, oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, I was going to say, the, the truth is, is when you study the old law, the reason, the reason the people failed so miserably is because of their lack of faith. Exactly. I mean, I mean, they would go through for a generation, maybe two generations. That they'd go through the motions, but then all of a sudden, because the faith wasn't there, it would just wear out. Well, and I don't want to belabor this much, much farther, but I think this is an excellent point that you make, and we're going to talk about uh, faith here in just a moment. But if you go to back Deuteronomy six, what Moses commanded them to do regarding teaching, teaching their children. Now think about what Paul says: faith comes by hearing in Romans six seventeen. Had they continued to have taught their children, their faith in God would have remained and their obedience would have been as it should have been. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. All righty. Um, Paul, do we want to bring into the discussion uh, the comments already flowing in the chat room before we actually begin our reading here? Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, <clears throat> we'll ignore some of the pre-show comments. Uh. Please. <laughs> yeah, hopefully those will be erased. They were more of of a personal nature, yes. uh, but as we look here uh, at, at what Randall Duval says in a very serious matter, uh, mm -hmm. and we see in the chat room, he says, in James 1.22, he quotes, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And so this is not, as John mentioned at the beginning of our study, this is not a new topic really, but this is just a further uh, examination, a further uh, teaching on this, and it's just like some of the other things we see, there, there's this natural flow that's taking place. And then uh, he also quotes Philippians chapter 2 and verses 12 and 13, where the scripture says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And I think that's a great point 
And one of the things that when we look at this passage, we often uh, talk with uh, some of our friends who don't believe that you need to do anything uh, so that you might have eternal life. And we may talk about things like baptism. And that certainly applies in this passage, but in the context, he's really talking more about faithful living every day, uh, not, not the act of baptism, but uh, certainly that applies too, that we have to be uh, doers of that word. And we have to not just have faith, but we have to accompany that with works of uh, righteousness, works of obedience that God has given us to do. But as we, as we look into this, we see, and we'll examine further, I think that we'll observe that some of the examples that he uses are about everyday application, applying the word to our lives as we live each day. Exactly right. Yeah, and, and one thing I just really quickly want to add to that is, you know, you mentioned that primarily he's dealing with our conduct as Christians. And I know that you agree with this. It certainly does apply to becoming children of God from the standpoint of uh, we have to do what God says. And Paul, you mentioned a word that I do not think that we can separate from true faith. And that's the word obedience. It goes hand in hand with our faith. Absolutely, and I wasn't saying that we should exclude those things oh, I know that. becoming a Christian, and I, yeah, we, we would be in uh, undoubtedly full agreement on that, but yes. I was just indicating that the context here is more than just those things we do to become a Christian, uh, but it, 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 uh, it includes that, but also en engulfs our lives uh, right. in, in other ways and in, in things that we must do to be pleasing to God. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, just real quick. Uh, when we started this study of James, one thing we established is who it was written to. It was written to brethren. Right. So that's the point. It's, that's much like Romans chapter 10, verses, uh, verse 32 there. Uh, no, Romans 10, 9 and 10, talking about confession. Yes. Many times we use that verse in reference to one becoming a Christian. And it is true, we need to be willing to profess our belief in Christ. But the context was written to Christians, reminding them why they continue to confess the name of Christ. You know, and it's not a one-time thing. Well, let's go ahead and start our reading. I'm going to get Daniel, since we've kind of um, just really hogged the, the airtime. Um, I have Daniel, if you would, read for us beginning in verse 14. And let's go ahead and read down through verse 17 in the text here. And what, what translation are you reading from, Daniel? I have the ESV. All righty, let me jump to that before you start. All right, anytime you're ready. All right. <clears throat> what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. All right, let's pick up with verse 14 there, and notice the question that he asks. He says, you know, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? And the question is, can faith save him? Now, let's bring up for just a moment the definition, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the, the screen share, and what you're about to see is a King James translation. I use the, um, the eSword program at eSword.org. And you'll notice here where he says faith. All right, we'll bring up that definition. Strong's says this faith, pistis, means persuasion. That is credence, moral conviction, as in a religious truth. And as we come down there, assurance, belief, belief, faith, fidelity. So this particular faith that he's referencing is the idea of one being convicted and persuaded by the evidence seen within our case the Bible the Word of God and so the question is what good what profit does a what what does it profit a man to be thoroughly convicted and persuaded of the truth and of God but yet do not do the things told to him by God you know where's the profit are they truly convicted are they pr truly persuaded. What are your thoughts on that, Paul? Uh, well, uh, I think that there, there's a couple of things about this idea of faith or belief that we need to think about. Uh, sometimes we talk about believing God, 
uh, are believing in God, that we believe that there is one God, and that, that's correct, but also that we believe God. We believe what he said. We're, we're assured of those truths. And here he does make that connection that not just it's not just those things that we say that we believe. It's not even saying that we understand and, and we uh, rely on the Word of God and maybe even understand the teachings of those, but we have to be willing to apply those. And he's going to use... Uh, here, I think, in, in the next verse, he asks a question, a spiritual question, can mm -hmm. faith save him? But he uses an everyday illustration, almost a parable, to teach about uh, the answer to that question. A brother or sister says, uh, excuse me, a brother says that he has faith but does not have works. Uh, what does it profit him is actually the first question. Then the second question is, can that faith, without works, can that faith save him? And yep he's going to use to show just how effectual that that kind of faith is to save one uh, by using something that you and I can understand very easily. Well, I tell you, before we get to that, let me go ahead and we're going to bring up, there, there are, we were talking about this um, before our study began. There are five different Greek words, and bear in mind, I'm no Greek scholar by any stretch of the imagination. But there are five different Greek words that are translated as faith or the idea of being trustworthy. The first one you'll see, and this right here is a Strong's numbering, if you've ever used Strong before. And the first word, 4100, is peace to you. And it's the idea of to have faith, as in a faith in a person to trust that individual. You know, So we trust God, um, we put our faith within him or our belief within him. But then the next Greek word, 4101, pistikus, we only use that one time when we use the term spike nard. It's the idea of pure or unadulterated nard. It's the only time it's used within the Bible. Jesus uses it there. But then there's pistis, and this is the, ver the word that is being used in the context today. And it's the idea of persuasion that is credence. Um, Strong says a moral conviction. And then you come on down, assurance, belief, belief, faith, fidelity, and all this is being based upon uh, the conviction, the persuasion. Then you have pistus be used in other passages, talking about being trustworthy. And then we have pistu means to assure of. And, and all of these verses except the one are used, or all these words are used within the Bible in reference to either our faith in God, our conviction, our trust in God, or, or us being trustworthy to Him. Now, the reason why I say that is the one that he's talking about here is so attuned to or so based upon our being convicted enough to act upon the knowledge that we have. And as Paul, as you said there, he does pose a very interesting question. You know, what profit is it to have this conviction without works? Can it save him. Yeah, is it any good for anything, basically? Yes. What does it profit? Uh, right. What use is it? Uh, could we go right. ahead, uh, John, and bring in the chat room before we get too far behind on this? Uh, they, they're they're going to be very active today, aren't they? I think so. Okay. And, and I just was trying to look at that and, and try to keep us from getting uh, getting too far All right, there uh, we go. Away, away from their comments. Randall sure. says, uh, people say you don't need baptism because it is a work, but belief is a work as well. And that's a great point. So if baptism will not save you because it is a work, then you cannot be saved uh, because of belief because it is a work as well. John 6, 29, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. And so since faith is a work, uh, if works uh, cannot uh, influence our salvation at all, uh, they're not a part of our salvation, then faith can't be part of that either. Absolutely. I think it's, if, if, not wanting to put words in Randall's mouth, but I think that's what he's, what he's saying. In James one twenty seven, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. I believe here he's talking about a faith that works, and we talked about that, that one who professes to be a follower of God, one who professes to be a Christian, needs to have a life that backs that up. And uh, here... Uh, Ken says, is the story in verses 15 and 16 an illustration or an application? And I think that's what we were getting at. And, and why don't we discuss that as we get there? Uh, I, I was indicating that uh, 
maybe, maybe it's both. Uh, but I was indicating there that I believe it, it's he's illustrating the point. He's answering the question, but but we can discuss that, and I'm open to, to talking about that. And then Randall says, the question is, what kind of faith do we need, active faith or dead faith? The demons have dead faith. We need to have active faith, which leads us to obedience. And then we're uh, glad that point. Josh Thornhill is, is chiming in, and he says, our faith causes us to act, but that doesn't mean we can dismiss works. And that's a good point as well. So I just wanted to get those comments in there so that as we proceed in our discussion, we can uh, address some of those and, and consider some of those as well. Absolutely. May, may I add something to the definition part of it just before we get too far along with the, the discussion? Sure. Okay. Uh, and I think you see a lot of those words, and I think three of them, one's more of a noun, one's more of an adjective, one's more of a verb, all meaning the same thing. Uh, but no, no definition, no lexicon ever trumps what Scripture says, and they steal a lot of the definition from Scripture. In fact, in Hebrews 11, verse 1, we see faith defined as the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And so when, when you look at the different dex dictionaries or lexicons, they're going to say conviction or assurance, uh, confidence, trust. Those are all part of it because that's what is included in, in the faith there. Absolutely. John, and I might mention also, just uh, as a side point, that uh, we're glad uh, uh, some, a first-time person has joined our study, and that is, uh, he's always been a person. I didn't know exactly how to say that. First-time viewer. <laughs> uh, Earl Baker from Pena, Illinois. Uh, and Earl preaches with a church that I worked with for a while. He preaches with a church in Vandalia, Illinois, and we're glad that Earl Baker's joined us today. Very good. Very good. All right, Tom, did you have something to say earlier? Oh, I was just going to make the comment. I know you're basically dealing with the word faith. Um, I was going to deal with a statement there, and we, we can kind of address what we're dealing with in verse 14. He asked that question, can faith save him? Do you think he has an answer to that based on the context? Mm -hmm. Yes. In other words, is there is there a necessary conclusion that we must reach? As yeah, a result of the question I, I, he's asking. Yes. Yeah, yes, absolutely. He says there, uh, the question is, really the initial question is, what does it profit? What good is faith if it does not have works? And he says, can it save him? And this is going to address uh, Ken's question. And I think he illustrates that in verses 15 and 16. Uh, while I think that the application of those two verses is something that we have to do as well uh, I, I, but I think he illustrates how effective it is by helping us to understand what it would be like to be hungry and without food and to have someone say depart in peace be warmed and filled but not to supply that need it's ineffective in supplying the thing that is necessary and just like saying that you have faith but not having works is ineffective in pleasing God. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, mm -hmm. and, of course, the point that I'm making in, in being so blunt with a statement is, in essence, what James is saying is faith without works cannot save him. So his answer is no. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. And, and that's the point. Go ahead. Uh, Paul, I, I would say that the answer to Ken's question or his or kind of the thoughts there, I would almost say that what we're looking at in verses 15, 16, and 17 is an illustration. Whereas in James chapter, earlier in chapter 2, when he talks about one coming into their services and they're showing partiality, would almost be more of an application. You know, here, let's deal with the specific thing you're doing. Now let's illustrate why faith is so necessary, or works is so necessary with faith. Yeah, we could, you know, whatever we could readily, worth. Yeah, we could readily point out that the point that Ken's make, uh, or that not, I don't think Ken's making a point, but the point of his illustration could be clearly taught. And we could look yes. at when Jesus says that you shall love your neighbor as yourself, and they ask, well, then who is my neighbor? And he teaches about the Good Samaritan, as we like to call it, and about how the priest and the Levite passed by on the other side, but the Samaritan stopped and helped the man. He says, who was his neighbor? Mm -hmm. And and you see this loving your neighbor as yourself comment, concept, but it seems to me that 
and I'm not above being wrong, but in verses 15, 16, and, and I would include 17, that he's saying there that to answer the question, can faith save him? Well, what good would it do if you were hungry and someone says, well, I hope everything goes real well for you, and, yeah. but they don't give you anything to eat. Uh, yeah. I'm cold, but they don't give you a blanket. Uh, it's not effective. It, it doesn't yeah. accomplish what it, what it ought to. And so... Uh, verse 17, thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Uh, faith that is an attempt to please God without the accompanying works uh, is ineffective and does not accomplish what it set out to be. That's right. That's right. Um, any thoughts, Daniel? Yeah, another part in there too is uh, he points out that faith by itself is dead. So Telling somebody and giving them comforting words, uh, you know, that's not wrong if it's accompanied with something you do with it. So right. telling somebody, go be warm and filled, is not wrong. Uh, that's right. encouraging words, words of comfort. But give them the food that they need along with that. Give them the blanket that they need along with that. Right. You know, help them out as well. Uh, just merely the, the faith is by itself is dead. But faith with things is certainly very effective. So... Right. Sure. Yeah, and, and we also emphasize along with that that faith is important. You know, for those who are listening to this study, we are not dismissing the importance of faith. Um, yeah, works without though, faith even, don't save is, either. Exactly. exactly. Works without faith is equally dead in God's eyes. And that's really the point. Well, I, I would even go, I didn't go a step farther, and I agree with that is that the, gen, the true faith that we're looking at demands works. If yes. we don't obey, then we don't have the faith of Abraham, as we see in Romans 3 and 4. We don't have the, the, the faith that is seen here in this chapter right here. Um, use, consider this illustration, and we're gonna, I'm going to add a little bit to this. If someone comes up and says, you know, I'm hungry and I'm, and I'm cold. Do you really believe them? Do you believe them enough to act upon it? Or do you simply say, well, go away and be warm and filled, but you're not convicted enough regarding their need to help them out? You know, and kind of right. illustrating, therefore, the same level of faith as, yeah, I believe in God, but I'm not convicted enough in him to follow his word and obey. Right. I think, and, uh, and James addresses that, too, in yes, just a few yeah. verses. Ken, uh, Ken brings out a point in our chat uh, that, that indicates that. I'll first of all pick up David Cox's comment where he says uh, the the empty words to the needy person accomplishes nothing and even would be an insult. Oh, uh, excuse where me. Where are we at? I'm sorry. <laughs> there yeah, you go. I, I need to back up one. It says it doesn't do anyone any good if you're able to help and you don't help and, right. and that's kind of faith without works. Then I'm sorry, what Ken said was the empty words to the needy person accomplishes nothing and may even be an insult, a professed faith without obedience accomplishes nothing, according to this text, and may even be an insult to God. And uh, I, I like, John, what you mentioned there, that uh, faith, if it is the faith that we're supposed to have, is going to have the accompanying works. And if not, then it's just a dead faith. Then Randall says, Matthew 23, 3, Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not according to their works, for they say and do not do. And so we see there uh, that some people who claim to be very religious but didn't do what the Word of God said. Uh, as, we, as we think about uh, those words uh, that how... Uh, we can even be an insult to God. We know on the Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Right. Well, faith not only will produce faith, but it will tell us what that faith needs to do uh, through the word of God. Right. Yeah. Uh, last week, I, I had a chance to listen to the, to the talk and so on. I know you all talked a little bit about uh, about. Uh, those who are not being, or those who are not yet saved, and uh, how when they obey the gospel, they appreciate salvation, and you compare that a little bit to those who 
who were, as, as we describe it, raised in the church. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and the difference between them. Um, but one of the things that came to my mind as I was listening to that, and it applies here with uh, Ken and Randall's comments, is how much God detests hypocrisy. And, and you know, th that is so, where you find, if there's degrees of judgment from that standpoint, I'm not trying to say that, but as you look at scriptures, what really, really turns God off is those who ought to know better. Right. And, and uh, you might say those who have been raised in the church. You know, Jesus in John 15, 22, where he talked about uh, the religious leaders, they don't have an excuse because they ought to have known better in that particular circumstance. So, I mean, we, we can tie that in here as we're dealing with we have to do what we're told, and we have right. to do it with faith. Um, not to harp on this too much, but the passage y'all referenced in Romans ten seventeen, the word faith comes by hearing. It's the same Greek word, the same idea of persuasion and conviction we're looking at here in James chapter 2. Right. You know, and it comes with the evidence, comes by hearing the word of God. So. Well, we see that so many people want to separate those things. They want to separate yes. faith uh, from the actions. Uh, and just like we look in the book of Titus, they want to separate the grace of God from obedience. But we read there that the grace of God teaches us uh, that there are certain things that we need to do. And so it's impossible to separate out our part of what we need to do from what God has done for us and uh, to separate our belief in him from the impact that it has in our lives. That's right. That's a very good point. All right. All right any other thoughts before we kind of step into the, the next section here, starting in verse 18? Well, just, John, uh, just to be clear, that really uh, I suppose that verse to the, to the question in verse 14, what does it profit, uh, if we look at that, what does it profit uh, if a man says he has faith, it's not what have works. And the other question, what can faith save him? The answer is verse 17. Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So he gives an, what I believe to be an illustration, uh, but he answers his own question, That's and right. that is that it's dead, it's useless, it's empty. That's a good point. We don't, and we don't need to step away from this section without emphasizing the, the very point that you just did here, that faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Very straightforward, very simple. And I think that uh, Tom's going to uh, help us here in a minute, that we understand that this harmonizes with everything else found in Scripture that's said about yes. faith and about works and about grace and about salvation and justification. Uh, it all, it all uh, fits together. That's right. Well, let's go ahead and go a little farther here now in the reading and Tom why don't you read for us let's read verses 18 down through verse 24 okay and, and I'm reading from the New King James Version uh, James there says but someone will say you have faith and I have works show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works you believe that there is one God you do well even the de demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. All right, let's come, at, come back up here now to verse 18. And observe here for a moment that he says, and kind of here is maybe an argument someone might throw up. Someone may say, well, you have faith and I have works. Well, to that individual, he would say, you show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. In other words, if a person is hanging on works alone, he's challenging them to show them his faith without his works. Whereas the person who is putting their emphasis on faith in God, that individual will be able to show his faith by 
his works. And you know, I think that's a very good point that for us to remember, it is possible to have all the right works, but not the necessary faith. But it's not possible to have the necessary faith without all the proper works. Right, John. Uh, it only makes sense. Uh, it's just sort of a logical argument he's making here. Uh, I, I was hoping maybe we could uh, introduce Ken Chapman's thought into the uh, into our discussion. Yes. And, and I, I have a I have a good reason for that. The first two words, right, Paul. <laughs> Now, see, Ken. The more often you say that, the better off you'll be. No, I'm. I'm only kidding. I'm not. I'm not arrogant to that extent. He says uh, we cannot separate saving faith and works of obedience. That that works both ways. Can one obey God by accident, or must the works be accompanied by faith? And I think when we think about that, we uh, realize that uh, there are people who live what we would call good moral lives. They do many right things in their life, mm -hmm. but that they don't possess faith. I knew someone like that in my life that was one of the finest human beings uh, you would want to know, but they did not have faith. And, and you cannot have this uh, just generally good works uh, without faith in God, but faith in God will teach you, and you'll learn those things that you need to do so that you can be obedient and pleasing to God. You notice Paul or Josh in the in the chat room just before Jan, Daniel or Randall jumped in front of him. <laughs> yeah. Josh says, "Without faith, all of our works will be meaningless, as in baptism." And I think that's the point behind Jesus' statement in Mark sixteen sixteen, right. where he said, "He that believes and is baptized shall be saved; he that does not believe shall be condemned." No amount of obedience to baptism you can be dunked in the water a hundred times, but if you don't have that sincere faith then you get wet every time. Faith and baptism, faith and works is what real yields our salvation and not the works alone. Absolutely. Or the faith alone. Or the faith alone. Well, and I would almost say that you can't, in the understanding of biblical text, yeah. you cannot have faith alone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, That's it's, exactly right. With true faith, you cannot have faith alone. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And, and that's true even for much of the religious world who teaches faith alone. Right, exactly. And I think they, they would say amen to what we say, except right. in the case in point of being saved with exactly. baptism. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, Paul, anything else do you want to, uh, from the chat room we want to bring in here? Uh, sure, we can do that. Uh, you notice that Josh Thornhill earlier said excellent point. I believe the excellent point was that I was right. Uh, so uh, but Randall Excellent Duvall, point to Ken saying, right, Paul. <laughs> yes. Hey, John. Uh, uh, I believe that's my interpretation of that, uh, that comment. <laughs> yeah, John and Daniel, I think next week we need to do a side study on humility. <laughs> We're fine. I, it's Paul that's got the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I, preach, I preached on pride recently, and it was probably the best sermon on pride I'd ever heard. Uh, uh, just kidding. Uh, People are going to abandon us pretty quick here. <laughs> okay, Randall Duvall says, the question I ask is where you get your work list. Sometimes they make up their own to-do list instead of using God's list. I think that's a great point. That's sort of what I yes. was talking about, about a person who just goes around seeking to do good. Uh, Colossians 3.17 says, And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And that's a great point, Randall, and I, I do appreciate that very much. As we think about our uh, duty before God, it is all about uh, serving God according to His terms and what His Word says that we need to do. And so we have to do it in the name, by His authority. And then Randall says, uh, as we look there again, uh, it is really not faith alone. It is everything but baptism. And I think that's... Uh, I think that comment was said in reference to those who would uh, argue with us about faith and works is they're not yes. arguing about faith and works in general, but they want to eliminate the necessity of baptism. And I think that's a good point. Right. And I, I'll apologize for getting off our topic. Uh, uh, I know we're, we're involved in serious Bible study, and uh, my short deviation, you'll, I'll ask you to excuse. <laughs> well, even Moses, who we know wrote Deuteronomy, observed about himself that he was the most humblest man. <laughs> Actually, I think Joshua probably wrote that, but <laughs> okay. Right. You know, uh, 
one thing that I want to say in observation as we're discussing this idea of faith and works, uh, you know, we've made the point, or you, the, the point was made about this text is written primarily to Christians and we need to tie it into faith and works from that standpoint. And of course, we emphasize this as we're discussing with those who teach faith only. You know, and as has been pointed out, uh, you know, really what it means is they're saying you don't have to be baptized. But but there's another thought that just came to my mind, and that is we could tie this to the idea of of uh, once saved, always saved. You know, which which is uh, another doctrine that I question. Uh, yeah. In, in essence, this passage refutes that. In that it teaches it's not simply enough that you believed in God, you have to continue to obey God even as a child of God. Well, to kind of play devil's advocate, I think where they would, I think they would agree that as a Christian, this comes into play. It's the whole going back to Calvin and Augustine, the idea that due to our corrupted nature that no one can come to believe on his own through even a study of the Word of God that the Holy Spirit has to move him. And so you have the irresistible grace that's been given. And therefore, that's why baptism has no part in our salvation, they would say, because we can do nothing of our own accord. So we would have to be saved first before we are baptized. But then they would pull James 2.18. But I, I agree with you completely, though. Whether we're talking to, about Christians or someone becoming a Christian, this shows that the genuine faith must have the works and cannot be had without the works. And continually. Continually, exactly. Continually. It's not a one-time act. It's not just a few acts. It's all the time. Exactly. Throughout our lives. Right. There may be some who would be listening to us or, or viewing us today or someone who will come across this study at some time as it's recorded. And it's important for us to realize as Christians that once we're baptized, that's not the end of our work. That's that's the beginning, you know, when we obey the gospel and we, we have our sins washed away. The Lord adds us to his church. That That's the beginning of when these uh, these things begin to be, be applicable all the time of doing those things that God has commanded us every day. And when we talk about walking by faith, what we're talking about is walking by what the Word of God says that we need to be doing. Exactly. That's exactly right. I put up there the, the address for questions at truthfactor.com if you want to send something directly to us um, instead of to one of us as individuals. We will, of course, be checking those um, throughout the course of the week there. Alrighty, so let's see here. Notice what he says, kind of jumping back into our text there, with that comparison. He makes the point in verse 19 that you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Pat yourself on the back. The demons do the same thing. Got kind of a little bit sarcastic, isn't he? Right. Now, what, what do you think about that, though? The the, the idea, and, and let, let's bring Daniel in on this, because he, he, he has um, sat quietly and patiently listened to us banter about. Daniel, what's your thought about when he says even the demons believe and tremble? What type of, is this the same type of belief? Or what, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, that's what I was going to throw over to you guys and uh, see how you address that first. Uh, but, <laughs> for instance, uh, you know, the demons uh, know more even than anybody else that God okay. is is one, that, that, you know, they know who he is. You see confessions of demons throughout Jesus' ministry that he's the most holy one. You know, he's the holy one of God. And, and so if belief and confession could save you, uh, why wouldn't the demons uh, be saved in that sense? Uh, but it, it's certainly right. something to, to consider that, like you said, you believe God is one, give yourself a, the pat of the, on the back, you're as good as demons now um, to, to that extent. I would, I would throw out, here's the reason why demons can't be saved, although they believe. And just kind of consider this for a moment. Some people suggest that demons are the angels who left their first abode. Okay, now I'm not sure if that's that's true or not, but let's say for the argument that demons are those angels that rebelled and and uh, left their first abode. They have seen everything possible to convince them that God is true, but yet they still disobeyed. 
Whereas with us, we haven't seen God eye to eye. We're working off evidence seen within the Bible. We're working off testimonies. And so we build our persuasion and our conviction based upon those testimonies. But once we see the Lord face to face, we are without excuse at that point. And that's why if we don't believe now, there will be no second chances for us. But whereas with demons, from the very beginning, they've known who God is, as you said. They know all that is to be known, and they still chose to rebel. So their, their belief cannot have any obedience because they have already rejected that when they disobeyed despite the knowledge that they had. But the point is, their, their belief in God is not enough to save them now. Right. What are your thoughts if, on that? Well, if we look here uh, in this passage, I was thinking that with all, with all of what you said, that he does use the point here, even the demons believe and tremble. So faith, uh, and, and I understand we could talk a long time about the origination of demons and all of that. Sure. But, mm -hmm. but faith is just simply not adequate. And, you know, I think about today that what you'll often hear people say is that all you need to do is believe that Jesus is God's Son. And I was thinking about Matthew chapter 8. Uh, and in Matthew chapter 8, uh, looking down at verse 28, uh, we see there that uh, it speaks of Jesus. And it says, when he had come to the other side, uh, to the country of the uh, Gergesenes, there met, he met two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that no one could pass that way. And suddenly they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Here were people that not only believed in God, but we see that they were people, uh, These not see that the demon-possessed men even confessed Jesus as the Christ, as the Son of God. Uh, but yet, uh, that's not the kind of faith that we want to have. Uh, no one wants to be associated with that. But instead, we have to have faith that really changes our lives and makes us uh, into s someone and doing something that we would not otherwise have done doing the works of God. Can I All add right. something that I run into yeah. just studying with people? Um, sure. And I think it's even in John Calvin's commentary on James. Uh, he, he says that uh, in he, he believes that in verse 19 that the you believe that God is one, uh, you do well, even the demons believe. Uh, his commentary says that he believes that the demons believe that God is one. That's their belief, not the belief in anything else. What are, what are you guys' thoughts on that? Just because I, I run into that frequently. Well, uh, James, well, uh, there in Matthew 8, they believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I was going to say, how would believing that God is one by itself causes a demon to tremble. What causes the demon to tremble is the power that God has. And they tremble because they know that they're facing his wrath. And, and I know like John pointed out, um, you know, if, if demons are uh, fallen angels or something to that effect, uh, then they have experienced the abilities and powers of God. They've seen them, and they know what they're facing. Let me throw something out there in regards to what Daniel asked, and I hadn't really thought about this, Daniel, but you know, the, the New King James or the King James says, Thou believest that there is one God. And this may give us a little bit more insight to the person claiming to have faith but not have obedience. The individual says, I believe in God. I'm good. And it may be that what he's saying is that you say that you believe in God, that you, you know, think about the time period. You had polytheistic religions, believing in a multitude of gods. And so here someone has reached a pinnacle in their understanding by saying, I believe that there's one God. And so that's sufficient for their life. It's not about obedience. It's all about believing in the one God. And he says, if you say that, you do well, for even the demons believe in the one God and they fear and tremble. Maybe that would be the way of, of looking at what he meant behind that statement. What are your thoughts, Daniel? Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I think uh, that's kind of why I threw it to you guys. I, I have my, my personal opinion that, too, I believe it's talking about 
uh, the, the demon's belief just in general, not just specifically the one. But I thought maybe you guys would have some, some good comments on that. And as far as the beliefs of those in James being that, uh, I think the whole section does apply in context who he's directly writing it to, to people who feel they can just have this belief without doing something about it. Uh, but the application of the thoughts, I believe, are true for all situations yeah. that have to do with faith. Let's, let's bring up the definition here real quick. When he says, thou believest, and the demons believe, that Greek word is one of the ones we referenced earlier, but it's not the same as 4102. This is 4100 piece to you. And it simply means to have faith. Okay. Well, well so, can I make a comment on that, brother? Please I, I do. Think, please do. Uh, in, in the previous uh, text, he's saying faith as a, as a noun. And so since he tells the demon uh, doing something as believing, it switches to the verb of the word. But I, I really don't believe there's a difference in the definition there. That, that's okay, just so my comments, though. I could be wrong on that. Think of the, more the difference between a noun and a verb as opposed to a, a, a different nature of the, def, of the word itself. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Very, very possible. Like I said, I'm not... Um, I, I opted not to take Greek when I was at college. Right. And, uh, <laughs> Too difficult. Uh, I was going to mention point, though, something that our conversation sort of points to. Uh -huh. uh, that just is, uh, there are some who would like to just reject James, uh, yeah. reject, reject James' writing, and they think that he's in conflict with what uh, the Apostle Paul teaches about some of these things. And uh, Martin Luther was one who, who mm -hmm. had his concerns about, uh, about, about what James wrote. And so uh, I think there are many who try to twist what James says to mean what they want it to mean. And there are some who want to reject what James wrote. But really, I don't think there's any conflict at all. Uh, I think it all harmonizes perfectly together when you put together what faith really is, what works we're talking about, not right. works of merit, but works of righteousness, works of obedience that we're given to do. And so that's that's important for us to, to keep in mind is that it doesn't have to be in conflict, but sometimes we may want to make it that way. Now, I have a confession to make here, and that is that Randall, I, while I was looking up Matthew 8, he quoted those two <laughs> verses in the chat, and I had yeah. just screen minimized and I was uh, using my online diction my online Bible to look it up and so uh, he was quicker on the on the trigger than well, I was when I saw that I thought you were just plagiarizing him so I know. <laughs> right well, well well I was thinking great minds think alike but I don't want to go there considering where we've been today so okay and we have a couple of other comments uh, we see there that David Cox uh, says if we look in the chat a lot of people claim that they believe in God but they are not obedient to but they are not obedient to God and, and that's exactly what we're talking about that's what we're getting at today and Titus 1 and verse 16 says they profess to know God, but in works they deny Him. And so it's possible that, uh, in thinking about Josh's good comment there, it's possible that we can claim to know God, and either by the wrong works or by the absence of works, we deny what we claim. Right. Yeah. That's a very good point. Very good it, point. It, incidentally, David Cox, uh, I don't think we've mentioned this, he's another one of the students there at St. Robert in that program. That's oh, right. So. That's great. I didn't know yep. that. Yes. So he's one of the uh, two of the three. And, yeah. and, and one other observation I want to make uh, about the even demons believing and trembling, uh, putting it into its context, consider the shock value of what he is saying there. And, and I think that's the point that James is getting at. You know, for those who are not doing anything or doing what they need to do, he's, it, it, it's, a, it's a shock factor. I mean, even as I read that, the way that we would use that for somebody who says all you have to do to believe, we would use it for the same reason, to get their attention. You know, uh, it has to be more than mere uh, mental assent which is sometimes yeah. what we're talking about when you deal with faith only, the acknowledgement that you believe in God. Or if they want to expand that, you believe in Jesus as the Son of God and He's your 
uh, a Savior, and His blood was shed for the sins. And uh, But it's still mere mental assent as opposed to actually doing something. Right. And, and I think there's an awe factor about the demons having that belief. Right. And when we look at ourselves, do we have that awe factor? We believe in God, but are we just in awe at how powerful he is, how yeah. merciful, how wonderful he is. A lot of times we go, yeah, I believe in God. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of, we read a passage and, and, and we're like, okay, that's that's the truth. But it really doesn't make an impact with us. And and that's not really the type of assurance or, or belief that we're striving to have. It needs to be impactful. It needs to have that awe factor with us as Christians as well. And, and that's James's point, I believe. You know, you you say you believe mm -hmm. that there's one God, you do good. Yeah. You know, good for you. You you, you need to have that the the all A W E factor. I thought y'all were saying ah is in ah h, and I was trying to figure that one out. <laughs> but you were saying ah A W E A W E. Yes, sir. Um, let's bring in uh, Tammy Salomon's comment, Paul, for just a moment before we. Yeah, continue. I would like to do that. Uh, I was going to say the ah factor is you know when I'm not speaking too well and I go ah uh, ah uh, uh, <laughs> or so, um. <laughs> Yeah, I have the awe factor, but this is the awe factor. Yeah, Tammy makes a great point. Tammy's joining us today. I was told from New Mexico, yes. and we're certainly glad that, that she is here. We have a, a good friend, uh, Tim Jennings, who came from New Mexico. But the it says here, uh, and on the other side of that, a lot of people lead good moral lives but refuse to commit, she says, to quote any particular deity or any particular religion, claiming that as long as they lead good lives, if there is an afterlife, they will be rewarded. Faith and works are coupled together, and you cannot separate them. Here, Tammy addresses something that's very prevalent in uh, the world in which we live, and that is that there are people who believe that, well, there's many different paths to God, that there, there are uh, many different ways in which you can serve God. As long as you're generally a good person and believe in something, or some God that ultimately it'll all be all right. And that's simply not the case. Here, yeah. the faith that we have in God uh, prompts us to have faith in His Son, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and it gives us the works that God has given us to do. And uh, she makes a good point because it's uh, it, it's a very, if, if you pay attention to what people say about uh, that, they don't want uh, to have to commit to being a member of the church. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't want to have to obey and believe in just Jesus, but they want to have this uh, idea of just some kind of mystical, I believe in that there is a higher being uh, or right. something like that. And that's not the faith that's being spoken of here. I think you guys have addressed that. It, it is. That's a good point. It is a faith, but not the faith. That we'll yes. Here. Yeah. And, and as we look there, uh, Randall says, demons are eternal beings who have seen God and stood in the presence of God but still rejected and refused to obey him. They will be punished in the end for their type of belief. Uh, and uh, he also says in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, Enter ye by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many... Uh, and and many there are that enter in thereby. For narrow is the gate, and straightened is the way that leadeth unto life, and there are few that find it. And we understand the contrast here between the many and the few. And Randall lays that out for us about those who, who will be saved and, and those who won't. Uh, another point, too, uh, you know, not trying to get jump too much ahead, but his point about demons believing and tremble, I think, stands in the context of it that, Faith alone doesn't save you. They can have the same type of faith that me or you have, but they're not obedient. They don't do anything about it. And that's, that's I think, part of his point in the context is that disobedience coupled with faith doesn't do anything. You, you have to make those works along with it to make that faith matter. And I think I, that's why I said well, what I said a while ago about the demons. They're, they had their chance to obey. And they did not. You know, here God was in their presence, they knew God existed, and they rebelled. You know, therefore showing that a simple acknowledgement is not sufficient. It has to have obedience as well. They've missed their mark because they rebelled. Now let us not rebel. Let us act upon the faith with obedience. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Go back to chapter 1. John, I think you've discussed that in your scriptural way before about angels 
Uh, I've heard you mention that and about demons. Uh, that might be a good topic for us to talk about sometime, about the origination of angels yeah. and demons and Satan and what the Bible says and doesn't say. And maybe uh, we could bring out some, some different thoughts about that. Well, let me, let me throw something out here that we've talked about. And um, we, I've noticed that we're at 12.01 our time, so we're nearing the end of our study. And so we'll, we'll do some wrap-up here in just a second. But we have talked about doing an open forum. Uh, maybe maybe once a month, uh, trying it out initially in this given time spot. And with the open forum, uh, it, we would kind of open up the, the Google Hangout to uh, uh, more individuals that come with cameras and mics. We will use a measure of discretion, obviously. Um, but kind of kind of you know having just an open discussion, including the chat room on various subjects, that would be an, an excellent opportunity for that. You know, to, to, to pull in differing ideas and thoughts and views on that subject. So I, I agree, Paul. I think that'd be a good study for us to look into. All righty, let's see. We are at 12.01. I really hate to end this without looking at verse 20, but verse 20 does kind of lead into verse 21, and then 21 into 22, and that's about 12.20 at that point. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so... So we may want to pull the discussion to a close at verse 19. Well, we, can, we could just say this much about it, that uh, verse 20, he restates something that we've already seen and adds the term foolish to it, uh, that we're foolish if we think that we can have faith without works and it not, right. be, de not be dead. And join us next week, and we'll jump uh, further ahead. I think that's a good point. That's a very good point. Right. All right, any final words? Uh, Paul, let's start with you. I uh, hope everybody has a great rest of the week. If you have a Wednesday night Bible study, we pray that you'll be very diligent and make sure that you get to that uh, assembly with uh, the Christians in your area. If you can ever uh, visit with us, we'd be happy to have you here in Ellettsville, Indiana, to come and see us. We're not too far from Bloomington, and would love to have you visit with us. And uh, You can check us out at ellettsvillechurchofchrist.com and would love to have you visit with us anytime that you had an opportunity. Have a great week. All right, Tom? All right. Uh, thank you for all the comments. We've had some very good chat in the chat room today. Uh, we, we've had a number of viewers, a pretty large amount, which so I, I want to thank everybody for your participation. I'm honored to be a part of this. Um, like Paul said, if uh, only in my case, if you are in the Los Angeles area, uh, we invite you to come worship with us. Uh, we have a website, www.roseavenue.org. All the information is on that website. And, and uh, again, if you have any questions, feel free to email me, and I will do my best to answer them. And I, too, hope that you have a great week. We'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Um, oh, Daniel. Any thoughts from you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd uh, I'd like to thank my sponsors, uh, my dad for the webcam and mic, and uh, Josh for the shirt and tie. Uh, but, no, uh, I I really the good appreciate looks you get from those. your mom, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, but I, I appreciate all those who commented in the in the chat room. We appreciate those very much, and we hope you keep those comments coming in further studies. Thank you very much, and I wish you all a wonderful week and and many blessings from God. Very good. Very, and I echo those same thoughts there. It's been so good having you with us this week. Uh, if you have any thoughts or questions for us, you can send them to questions at truthfactor.com or individually. You can write to me, John, at truthfactor.com or Paul at truthfactor.com or Tom at truthfactor.com or Daniel at truthfactor.com. Any way you'd like to contact us, please do so. If you're in the Oklahoma City area, you'd like, we'd like to for you to come and be our guest at worship services. You can find more information about us at seminolepointpointe dot org. And remember the Scriptural Way broadcast at live.scripturalway.org on Tuesday nights at 7.30 p.m. And although they're not here with us today in the chat room, I do want to remind everybody of the virtual, the virtual Bible study dot com, the broadcast on two, on Thursday nights at 8 o'clock Central Standard Time at the virtual Bible study dot com. One thing to know, and I'll get, get done here real quick, at the Truth Factor, we try to use it as a housing point for many different teaching videos. You'll see different studies that we've done here locally, uh, but you'll also see a link for the virtual Bible study, and I try to include the most recent study. And so you can view that study here, but if you want to get the live study, 
you want to be at their website Thursday nights at 8 o'clock. Well, Lord willing, you can join us again next Wednesday at 11 o'clock Central Standard Time. That will be noon Eastern Time. And 9 o'clock Pacific Time. Right here at live.truthfactor.com. Have a wonderful week.